Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Ackerman, Director of Northwestern University's Institute for Public Health and Medicine. And I would like to welcome you all to our webinar series titled Explorations of Careers in Public Health, which is facilitated by Dr. Peter Orris. Dr. Orris is Chief of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at University of Illinois Health, and also a faculty member in the Department of Preventive Medicine here at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. He's well known for civil rights activism, work to eliminate environmental health hazards, and promotion of universal, equitable healthcare access in the United States. Here at Northwestern, Dr. Orris has taught and co-directed several courses, including a popular course that brought public health leaders to the classroom to speak about their own careers. Today, we continue that tradition with our special guest, Professor Sir Michael Marmot. Professor Marmot is Professor of Epidemiology at University College London and Director of the University's Institute of Health Equity. Shortly after completion of his medical degree at University of Sydney back in 1968, Professor Marmot began his career in public health attending the University of California, Berkeley, where he earned a master's degree in public health followed by a PhD in epidemiology in 1975. Over the ensuing four decades, he has contributed in countless ways to our collective understanding of how structural and social conditions play dominant roles in shaping individual and population health and health equity. Over his long career, Professor Marmot has designed and led a number of longitudinal studies on the social gradient in health, including the Whitehall II studies of British civil servants, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, and several international research efforts on social determinants of health. Professor Marmot was chair of the World Health Organization's Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which produced the, the 2008 report titled Closing the Gap in a Generation. He also auth authored The Health Gap, The Challenge of an Unequal World and Status Syndrome, how your place on the social gradient directly affects your health. In February, 2020, he launched the Marmot Review, 10 Years On, a report of health inequalities across England, 10 years after his 2010 strategic review on health inequalities, which was titled, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. Professor Marmot is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and has been recognized with numerous international awards as well as honorary doctorates from 18 universities. In 2000, he was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen for services to epidemiology and understanding health inequalities. It's truly my pleasure to now turn the microphone to Peter to lead our dialogue with Professor Sir Michael Marmot. And I will add before turning it over that um, we do encourage audience participation in this event, and to do so, you may submit questions for Peter uh, and for uh, Sir Michael Marmot uh, by using the Q&A function in your Zoom window. Uh, do not use the chat function, please. We might post some announcements there, but the chat function is not being monitored for questions. Uh, Dr. Orris will take over from here and uh, moderate the Q&A. Thank you. Peter? Thank you, Ron. Uh, we're getting this oil. This is working pretty well now. You covered all the points that I was going to stick in. Uh, this is really an exciting uh, seminar we're going to have today, and uh, it's going to be a little different uh, than the usual lectures from uh, uh, Sir Michael Marmot uh, and uh, the uh, scientific meetings and the seminars that uh, he has uh, become world famous for it. It's, it's uh, really exciting for us because uh, public health generally does not have a lot of superstars. Um, you can even be director general of uh, WHO and people will say who? <laughs> but uh, outside of Dr. Fauci at the moment, uh, who's our uh, last uh, bright light or our recent bright light, uh, Dr. Marmot on the world uh, scale is uh, our superstar. And what is totally extraordinary about this is how open and, uh, and uh, interested he is in all of us and interaction. 
people. And one of the qualities that he brings is his extraordinary ability uh, to interact with people from a host of backgrounds, from politicians, from uh, clinicians to public health people on a level that uh, complements their intelligence for interest in this area, as well as uh, finds ways of explaining complex concepts in simple terms. So the rest of us uh, are able to grasp them and uh, understand the uh, activity derivative from them. And um, uh, while this seminar has been directed primarily to uh, residents in training and students uh, getting their master's degrees and uh, PhDs uh, or young career people, uh, we hasten to say that um, uh, I will by no means censor Mr. Michael about his uh, desire to be speaking about the current situation, where we go from here after the pandemic, et cetera. Let me finally say one last thing in the introduction, as unusual and eclectic as this introduction has been for him, uh, and that is uh, to bring him back to a Northwestern base. As you know, the founding chairman of preventive medicine at Northwestern was Jeremiah, is Jeremiah Stamler, uh, he was the founding chairman, he's still uh, uh, leading in uh, epidemiology and public health. And he <laughs> recruited uh, Dr. Marmot to uh, participate in his international symposiums that he and his wife Rose uh, organized and ran on an international uh, level for many years in the early 80s. And so uh, Sir Michael was one of his faculty, and I uh, must say uh, he was the reason I came to Northwestern and was uh, absolutely delighted that he allowed me into his department uh, to teach some of the issues that I thought were important. So we bring that around. Um, let me begin uh, by uh, asking um, uh, the questions, early career questions. Uh, you, as I understand it, were born in London. You were born in London the same year I was born, but 10 months before, which was really a different era. Uh, for those of you not knowing what VE Day uh, was, that was victory in Europe uh, in the Second World War. Uh, and Dr. Marmot was born during the Second World War in England. And I was born after VE Day uh, in the United States, set us in two different eras. As I understand it, shortly thereafter, um, you migrated with your family to Australia. And uh, how old were you at that point? I was four and a half years old. Ah, yes. <laughs> so uh, not much choice in that matter. And you grew up. I convinced my family to move to sunnier climes. Uh-huh. And um, you went to elementary and high school in, in Sydney, was it? Yes. And you decided uh, uh, to uh, be trained as a physician. What, what went into that decision? Why health? Well, I was interested in science um, and I didn't have the confidence that I could be a brilliant scientist. And I thought there was no point being a second rate scientist, um, but I thought I'd keep my options open and I could enroll in medicine and always shift to chemistry, but I couldn't enroll in chemistry and shift to medicine. Uh, so it's not that I had a passion to uh, cure the sick or remedy social injustice. I'd like to pretend I did, but I didn't. Um, I was really interested in science. Once I enrolled in medicine, I got hooked. Then, you know, it was sort of an escape valve, but it didn't become a second choice. Once I was there, I got hooked. Um, everything about the scientific side of it. And it was only after two, three years. So you remember in Sydney, uh, it was a six year undergraduate degree. 
So unlike the US where you do an undergraduate degree and then a four year medical graduate degree. So I went straight from school to be an undergraduate in medicine. And as usual, I didn't know anything. Um, I just knew that I was quite interested in the scientific side. And then at university, I started to grow up and realized there were, the science was fascinating, but there was more to it than science. I actually uh, did a little bit of a degree in English literature, uh, which was one way I expressed my interest in wider things. Um, and uh, graduating uh, uh, with the MBBS, you uh, then did a residency or a, uh, or a um, house officership, if you will, in, um, in medicine internal medicine? Did you practice medicine in clinic? Well, I, for a couple of years as a junior doctor, as a hospital doctor in internal medicine, already as a medical student. And if you read my book, The Health Gap, in my preface or introduction to the book, I lay this out a little bit, but already in medicine, as a medical student, I used to walk around thinking surgery is failed prevention. Why would you want to operate on somebody other than trauma? But even then it's failed prevention. Um, it seemed a pretty crude way to deal with cancer. Um, and, and I thought, well, maybe medicine in a way is failed prevention. When people get sick, they clearly, clearly uh, need access to high quality care. But I was already thinking in that way. And then as a junior doctor practicing in the main teaching hospital in Sydney, in an inner city area where there were migrants living in relative poverty. And they would come in to pay as patients to the accident and emergency room. And I thought these people are coming in with problems in their lives. They have a pain in the belly. They couldn't speak English very well. And we were told, give them a bottle of white mixture and send them home. And I thought, they've got problems in their lives and we're treating it with a bottle of white mixture. That made no sense to me. So I was already, much as I enjoyed clinical medicine, I was already thinking, oh, no, we've got to deal with some of the social conditions that give rise to people's illness. We can't just wait till they're at the end and then try and treat them. Let's look upstream a bit. So you were propelled into medicine because of the uh, social equality uh, mission and goals, uh, as opposed to vice versa. You didn't grow out of medicine into the public health. Uh, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, I, I wanted to look at prevention. Um, and I didn't say I was pretty ignorant. And there was an important, you know, as so many people say, um, the accident of having important people um, who make a difference. And there was a chest physician. I was working in thoracic medicine. And there was a chest physician named Peter Harvey who um, had a good friend in New Zealand who had moved from being a cardiologist to being an epidemiologist. And Peter used to go off and join Ian Pryor on his studies in the Pacific Islands, and then migrants from the Pacific Islands to New Zealand. So doing epidemiology, and Peter came back from one of these trips to New Zealand. He'd been to a meeting and he said, I've got just the thing for you. It's called epidemiology. So go on, tell me more. He said, well, there are these doctors and statisticians and social scientists, and they all work together. And it's your interest. They are asking questions like, why do people living in different sorts of environments, social and cultural environments, have different rates of illness? And I said, you can actually study that? He said, yeah, that's what these people are doing. And he said, I met these two terrific guys at this meeting. One was John Castle at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. 
and the other was Len Syme at University of California, Berkeley. And I told them that we've got this really difficult fellow, young chap, who's driving us crazy because um, he keeps wanting to ask uncomfortable questions. Um, would you be happy to take him off our hands? And they both said yes. And I'd never heard of North Carolina and I had heard of Berkeley. So I went to Berkeley and did a PhD in epidemiology with Len Syme. And you decided a PhD was necessary. Why? Why not uh, as a cardiologist, uh, you know, uh, uh, inculcate that with it or, or take your social mission uh, in that way? Why, why did you need the uh, PhD? And we're going to get to some of the questions over here. Well, in a way, it was a push and a pull. Um, just to give you the context, I was at the University of Sydney at the Royal Prince Alfred teaching, which was the main teaching hospital. And Australia at that time, in the late 60s, early 70s, um, the model, you didn't even go interstate. You stayed where you were. If you grew up in Sydney, you went to University of Sydney, or then there uh, it was a second medical school, University of New South Wales, and that's where you went. And if you were in the main teaching hospital, that's where you trained, and that's where you became an academic or a consultant physician. And when I said that I was not going to apply for the training program in internal medicine, somebody said to me, big mistake, big mistake. Once you get off the ladder, you'll never get back on again. And I thought, yeah, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to get off the ladder. I don't, I see that future mapped out. I can see what it looks like and I want to do something different. So I jumped uh, without quite knowing what I was jumping into, um, just knowing that I wanted to study uh, understand how people's social and cultural conditions impacted on their health. And I guess I was convinced that to study it, I needed proper training in research, which meant a PhD, um, so I could do it properly. So I did an MPH and then went on and did a PhD. And do you find, and would your advice be for young people today, um, uh, that the PhD was particularly helpful to you in, uh, in both the academics and your research, uh, as well as in your ability to uh, persuade, if you will. Uh, well, I didn't think at that time, I had no idea. If you'd asked me back then, let's say I arrived in Berkeley towards the end of 1971, it's a long time ago. Um, and if you'd asked me, where did I see myself ending up? I didn't even know what country I would end up in. I guess I assumed I'd end up in Australia, um, but I had no idea what kind of position I wanted, what my career looked like. I was just pursuing interesting things. And it seemed to me I needed to learn research skills. Now, I've had young people working with me since, and I've tried to encourage them to do PhDs. And some say, yeah, we'll do it. And others say, no, I want to get a training in public health. I want to be a public health doctor or professional. Uh, I don't want to do a PhD. Now, I think it's extremely helpful because it teaches you what research is about, um, it teaches you how to think analytically about problems. Now, some people can do that without doing a PhD. Uh, but, and as Len Syme said to me, you'll never again get so deeply into a subject as you do with your PhD. You, you live with it for years, that same subject. And there, the house we rented at Berkeley, there were marks on the wooden walls where I threw my pen at the wall, you know, with frustration. Uh, so it's all of that, which is wonderful training, but it doesn't mean it's for everybody. But I certainly, I didn't think of it in terms of advocacy. I thought about it in terms of learning research skills and 
investigating a really interesting topic, which was acculturation and coronary heart disease in Japanese Americans. So the study I worked on, the so-called Nihon San study, was a study of men of Japanese ancestry living in Japan, Hawaii, and California. And as they migrated across the Pacific, the rate of heart disease went up and the rate of cerebrovascular disease went down. And I focused on the California Japanese and showed that the more acculturated they were, and not just in terms of diet, but social and cultural, uh, the greater the rate of heart disease. And an extraordinarily interesting uh, issue. I mean, you asked, was it advocacy? No, it wasn't. But uh, just a few years ago, um, quite recently, I found myself sitting with the director of the regional office of the World Health Organization for the Asia, Asian Pacific region, the Western Pacific region of WHO, a uh, Japanese doctor. And we were talking, he was asking me about what I'd done. And I mentioned the Nihon San study. And his eyes opened, he said, I learned about that in medical school. That was you. Oh yeah, I remember the name now. Okay, so um, that was helpful to work with that region of WHO. Uh, but that isn't why I did it. I did it because it was extraordinarily interesting. And then I got the bug. I wanted to do research. So let me ask you another question on degrees for a moment. Uh, there are some people in the training program where the MPH is the final degree that they're getting as a graduate degree. Um, and some look at the MD, MPH, uh, is that necessary? And we've explored the PhD component of it, but do you find doors are open to you because of your MD, PhD, um, and uh, or MPH as well? For instance, at WHO, if you wish to work, on an international level. Is an MPH uh, an adequate degree for this? Well, if you're asking about me, I don't have the counterfactual. So I don't know what doors would or wouldn't open if I hadn't got these degrees, but that isn't why I did them, as I said. Um, I, I think you've got to do good work, be, um, uh, be appropriately trained for the job if, part of what you want to do is research, then the PhD is very important. In an earlier generation, an MD was vital. Um, to be in public health without an MD was very difficult. There was prejudice against people without an MD. That I would like to think is no longer the case. Um, I'd say it was an earlier generation. That's no longer the case. Where certainly in Britain, there are public health leaders uh, who don't have MDs. And I, d I personally don't think they are, they are in any way disadvantaged by not having an MD. So as long as we thought that public health was kind of a branch of medicine, then you have to have an MD. But if you think, well, it's, it's the science of improving society, to get better health, then a different set of insights perhaps are important. I mean, understanding biology is very important, no question, but you don't necessarily have to have an MD to do it. Let me go to some of these, uh, you got to the nub of the question, that's what I was asking. Uh, there's a question, uh, first one, what areas in epidemiology would you advise pursuing a career in? And perhaps this is particularly interesting now with the avalanche of infectious disease epidemiology as opposed to, say, the second epidemiologic revolution with cardiovascular and chronic disease. Do you have thoughts for people uh, training today? I've tried very hard not to advise young people what they should do. Uh, I tried advising my own children and they never listen to me. So why should I try and advise other young people? Um, so it, it, you've got to go where your fancy takes you. What I can say 
is once I started working in the area which I could call social justice and health, health inequalities, um, health inequities, what a privilege, what a privilege it is every day to know that you're working to try and improve the health of disadvantaged people, whether it's social, social and economically, racial, ethnically, or gender, disability, um, sexual orientation, but working in the area of health equity means that your daily work is trying to improve the health of those who are disadvantaged. And that's an absolute privilege. But I'm not going to give people advice as to which one they should go into. Um, well, we just cleared away a lot of degree questions <laughs> with, with one fell swoop. Um, let me see. Um, what other backgrounds, other than medicine or biology or, uh, if you will, biostats and uh, epidemiology, do you think uh, are particularly vital today in pursuing uh, what you're describing as the global public health uh, mission, if you will? Well, one of the things I found um, all through my working life, and particularly when I wrote Status Syndrome, and then I wrote The Health Gap, because my lens is health inequalities, and because it is around the social determinants of health and health inequalities, everything's relevant. But, um, but it's not randomly relevant. I have a particular focus on how these things impact on health. Over the last few years, for example, I've been writing book reviews and other things for The Lancet, uh, The Lancet Medical Journal. The one I published last Saturday was a review of Michael Sandel's The Tyranny of Merit. So he's a Harvard philosopher who's written uh, critically about the meritocracy. Well, that's highly relevant to what I do. I'm concerned about stratification in society. Meritocracy on its surface sounds like a good thing. Uh, rewarding people on the basis of merit rather than aristocratic privilege. But as Sandel points out, uh, if, you, if rich people can say, I did it, it's me, I earned all that money, this is reward for me being a terrific person. What about the people who don't make it, who then feel humiliated? Because in a society that rewards the successful, it's difficult to avoid the conclusion, if you're not successful, then it's your fault. And that means humiliation. And as I thought reading Sandel, the meritocracy doesn't touch the issue of inequality. The whole rhetoric of rising, work hard, study hard, get an education, and you too can get out of your humble origins and become successful. That's the whole rhetoric. Well, it's untrue. We know it's untrue. Social mobility has been declining. And that's what the evidence shows. Now, what I've just touched on is philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology. So in that little disquisition of two minutes or whatever it was, uh, talking about a piece that I wrote, published in The Lancet last Saturday, I've touched on those disciplines that I just talked about. Now, if you'd asked me when I was starting out, what disciplines did I need to know? I'm not sure I would have come up with those, uh, but they're all highly relevant. Um, and as I've got more concerned with uh, what I call sustainable health equity, then the whole issue of sustainability is highly relevant. Uh, we need to deal with the climate crisis at the same time as we're trying to deal with health equity. So um, be well trained in your core discipline, epidemiology and public health. If you're interested in research, get a research training, which means a doctorate. Um, 
but then be open-minded as to where you learn what you learn, uh, what you need to know. Now, it's extraordinary. You have stimulated more questions than I've seen at any of these uh, seminars before. We'll get to some of them, but let me ask you another one of mine. Um, and I'm very interested, first of all, it, it derives from your extraordinary strength of talking to everybody um, and uh, being able to communicate with everybody about these issues. But basically, you describe these issues to everybody, and you talk to both the bad actors and good actors. And it always, it, the question of what you see as the value of that, uh, if you will, uh, separated from the issue of organization and mobilization of the oppressed, if you will. Um, and what's your role within that? Why have you chosen? this role? Well, it's commonly said that people get more conservative as they get older. I think the opposite has happened to me. I've got more committed to, to seeing change as I've got older. I want things to change. If being conservative, I don't mean conservative in the bizarre way it's currently defined in the United States of America. Um, that means anti-science, anti-truth, God knows what it means. Uh, but, but conservative, you know, I have respect for people who are conservative, small c conservative. Uh, I may disagree with them, but I have respect for them. Um, not the large C conservatives the, um, in the current US incarnation of it. But I've got more committed to change. And if I can be self-indulgent for a moment, when, when I came, as it were, back to Britain, when I left Berkeley, and I started doing research on the Whitehall study, uh, showing the social gradient in life expectancy, mortality from a whole range of causes. In other words, the higher the status in the British civil service, the longer the life expectancy, the lower the age specific mortality rates. Parenthetically, I got a lot of support from the US National Institutes of Health for those studies, um, that, which always tickled me a bit that the US government was supporting me to study British government servants, um, which I thought was quite neat. Uh, but uh, the reason NIH supported me was I made the case that what I was learning was highly relevant to any um, complex society. And as I started doing this as a researcher, but the slow hum underneath it was what if somebody took these results seriously? What would they do about inequalities in health? And then Margaret Thatcher was elected prime minister in 1979. And she said, there's no such thing as society. Well, if there's no such thing as society, there can't be any social causes of ill health. She also said, um, and she got her ministers to say that health inequalities was some old fashioned Edwardian notion and we shouldn't deal with it anymore. So for the next 18 years, what I did was pure research because nobody was interested in the application of it, at least in Britain. Interestingly, a colleague from Canada with the beautiful name of Fraser Mustard, uh, came and sought me out in London. And he said, your research is highly relevant to public policy. And I said, not in Britain, it isn't. Nobody wants to know. He said, well, it is in Canada, come to Canada. So I went and we got part of a public health group, a population health group in Canada. And I had quite a lot to do with them. And then, of course, in Britain, the government changed. And yesterday's pure research became today's applied research. Suddenly they said, we really would like to know what to do about health inequalities. 
Well, I've been studying this for the last 18 years. Nobody asked me that question before. I can tell you quite a lot. And one thing led to another. Uh, and in fact, with the WHO Commission, and I was still mainly a researcher, but I was still feeling a bit frustrated that not enough was happening with the research findings. And Jeff Sachs had chaired for the WHO, the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, and said, we've got to improve health in order to get economic growth. And Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize winning economist and philosopher who was the master of Trinity College, Cambridge, had invited me to do a mini sabbatical at Trinity College, Cambridge. And over high table and probably a good claret, I said to Amartya, don't you think Jeff Sachs has got it upside down? We don't want to improve health in order to get a better economy. We want to improve society in order to get better health. I didn't go into medicine thinking, oh my gosh, if I can cure this individual's disease, he might become richer. And I didn't go into public health thinking if we can improve the health of the population, the population might become richer. I didn't see myself as serving the economy. I saw it the other way around. If we can improve economic and social conditions, maybe we could improve health. And Amartya said, I agree with you. I said, how about we get a group together to say that? And Amartya said, okay, I'll join you, but it might be a good idea to get WHO backing. So J.W. Lee from Korea had recently been elected, been elected Director General of the World Health Organization. And uh, I asked if I could see him. So I went to Geneva, I gave a seminar and I had a meeting with J.W. Lee. And I said, how about setting up a commission on social determinants of health? I explained what I had in mind and it took a few months. And then he announced to the World Health Assembly that equity in health was a priority for him. And he was setting up a commission on social determinants of health and that I would chair it. So that was a big change. It meant packaging research. Uh, when we did consultations, one very senior academic said he'd been involved in some other commission. And essentially the report was written before the commission formed. He said, in the case of this commission, that won't happen because Michael doesn't know enough. Um, okay, that's a sort of backhanded compliment, but it meant that we spent three years gathering the evidence uh, globally on social determinants of health. But now, whereas as a researcher, my motivation was to find out, now we wanted the evidence not just to find out, not just to understand, but to recommend action, policy and practice, to use the evidence, to get evidence-based policy and practice. And the WHO Commission then led to the setting up in England of the Marmot Review uh, on Health Inequalities. I was invited by the British government, by the Prime Minister, um, to conduct the review which we published in 2010 as Fair Society Healthy Lives. And then one thing led to another. The European region of WHO said, could you do a commission for us? I said, nah, I've done a global commission. I've done it for England, one country. Why would I want to do it for a region? And they said, because it keeps it on the agenda. So we did the European review of social determinants and the health divide. And then the Pan American Health Organization, the WHO region of the Americas said, could you do one for us? So we did the PAHO Commission on Equity and Health Inequality in the Americas, which we published um, in autumn of 2019. And then the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office, North Africa and the Middle East, uh, invited me to Cairo 
and said, we'd like you to do one for us. I said, I couldn't possibly. They said, why not? I said, I don't know anything about your region. Um, and they said to me, it's an equity issue. You did it for Euro, you did it for Paho, you owe it to us, you have to do it for us. So with a set of good colleagues from the region, uh, we will at the end of March, on the 31st of March, publish our commission on uh, social determinants of health in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO. So in other words, to come back to the questions your young colleagues were asking me about careers, I didn't plan my career. I, so I, how can I tell anybody else how to plan their career? Um, one thing led to another. I did research because I really, 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 really wanted to do research. It was really interesting. And the purpose of doing the research was to publish a paper. And at the end of it, if someone said, so what? So what means publish another paper, do yeah. more research and publish another paper. Um, and then when I asked myself, maybe that's the wrong answer to the so what question. The answer to the so what question should be, well, what are we going to do about what we found? Now, it took me a long time to get to that point. Uh, I'm full of respect for people who get to that point more quickly and say, I don't want to do what he did, spend 40 years doing research and then get to the application. I'd like to do it more quickly. Great, we need all sorts of different people. So let me let you segue into Build Better, Fairer, um, the most recent uh, report, because I think it's a direct extension of what you're saying. Uh, I've given up on the, the millions of questions we're getting. What, where do you think we go from here after having been swallowed by this infectious disease plague? Yeah. Well, one of the tricky questions is how political you get. And I've tried in Britain to maintain the fiction that I'm not party political. Um, and you notice the words I used. I've tried to maintain the fiction that I'm not party political. I was commissioned to do the Marmot Review in 2010 by a left of center government, the Labour government. But soon after I reported, they were voted out and there was a right of center government, a conservative led coalition government. And they had very little interest. Uh, I mean, they published a government white paper which embraced my review, which was very nice. I thought, great, I can be commissioned by left of center government, have my report embraced by a center right government. This is terrific, it's easy. Um, but then they galloped off in a different direction. So in February, exactly a year ago, I remember the date because I um, called my daughter to wish her happy birthday today. And she said, yeah, you remember you published your 10 years on review on my birthday last year. So I remember the date, 25th of February. And looking at what had happened in the previous 10 years since I'd done the Marmot Review. And I called it Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on. And the picture was terrible. My summary was we have lost a decade and it shows. An improvement in life expectancy, which had gone on for 100 years of about one year every four years, in 2010-11, more or less ground to a halt. And when we compared the question, there was a new government elected in 2010, could they have had something to do with it? And the question they asked me was, maybe we've just reached peak life expectancy. So we looked at what had happened to improvement in life expectancy in that decade from 2010 to 2019 in other countries. And the slowdown in the UK was more marked than in any other rich country except the United States of America. You are the only country that looked worse than us. So no, we hadn't reached peak life expectancy. 
The second feature of the health picture was increase in inequality. The social gradient in health, which I described in the Whitehall studies initially, if you classify people by the level of deprivation of the area, the more deprived the area, the shorter the life expectancy. And that gradient had got steeper. And third, life expectancy for the poorest people outside London was going down. And you're familiar with that in the United States. We were looking like the United States pre-Trump, pre-Trump. And I've been saying, there's a lot of other people saying that the problems the US had caused Trump, not the other way around. Deaths of despair predated Trump. He tapped into that discontent. Uh, he did it in a malicious, malevolent way, and he didn't do anything about improving things, um, but he tapped into that discontent, which led to deaths of despair. So at, in my 2010 review, you asked me a simple question. I'm giving you a long answer. Sorry about that. Go ahead. In my 2010 review, building on the WHO Commission, we had six domains of recommendations. Equity from the start, early child development. Number two, education and lifelong learning. Number three, employment and working conditions. Number four, everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Number five, healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work, including housing, environment, and number six, taking a social determinants approach to prevention. You notice I didn't mention the health care system. We are blessed with the National Health Service. We have the most equitable access of any health system globally and vitally important, but I didn't feel I needed to address it. Unlike the US where you have inequitable access. So that's, uh, that's important. But so though, and in general, what had happened over the decade was those six domains had all got worse. The government had rolled back the state, they decreased public funding and they'd done it in a most regressive way. The poorer the area, the greater the reduction in funding. It was highly likely that these changes in government policy had led to the miserable health situation that we saw. And I made a whole set of recommendations about how we could do things differently. And then the pandemic crashed upon us. And I said at the beginning of the pandemic that it would expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. And indeed it did. We could see the mortality from COVID-19 followed the social gradient. The more deprived the area, the higher the mortality from COVID-19. And it looked very similar to the social gradient in all-cause mortality with some excess in the most deprived areas, which we think is related to working in a frontline occupation and living in multi-generational overcrowded households. We also saw the big excess in Black British, in Bangladeshi and Pakistani. So these ethnic differences, much of which was linked to geography and deprivation and worsening in these social determinants. So instead of waiting 10 years, I waited 10 months and produced a second report in 2020, in December, which I called Build Back Fairer. Your president, President Biden, and our prime minister, Boris Johnson, are both talking about Build Back Better. Good. I'd like to talk about Build Back fairer, to use the pandemic, building on what I reported 12 months ago, to say, as we emerge from this catastrophe, we do not want to reestablish the status quo. We need to do things differently, build back fairer. Now, for what it's worth, having said, to, related to your earlier question about my talking to different people, uh, we have this quaint ritual in the British Parliament, which you might have seen on public television, called Prime Minister's Questions. And 
a Labour MP asked the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, Conservative Prime Minister, what he was going to do about my Build Back Fairer report. And the Prime Minister, in only 90 seconds, managed to stretch the truth three times. He said, I have the highest regard for Michael Marmot. That was number one. Uh, number two, we've worked together for a long time. I thought something wrong with my memory. Um, and third, he said, be assured that as we emerge, we will build back fairer and deal with the most vulnerable and poorest people in society. Well, I didn't quite believe it, but still he said it. And then two weeks later, the leader of the opposition, Labour Party, the left of centre party, Keir Starmer, made a big speech about what Britain should look like as we emerge from the pandemic and referenced my report and what I'd done. So we are being talked about. And now, conversation, talk, doesn't lead to action, but it's not a bad first step. Um, so when I, I'm not ready to bow out just yet, it sounds like I'm bowing out, not at all. We're trying to engage people in action. But what started, to come back to your young colleagues' questions, what started in my mind as an interest in research on topics that I thought were highly relevant to the public health has ended in trying to influence the political debate and get other actors involved. Um, the Medical Royal Colleges in Britain, um, the British Medical Association, um, and globally in other countries as well. Uh, believe it or not, uh, Peter, I was invited to spend a day with the American Medical Association in Chicago, your neighbors. And when they invited me, I said, you know, I was president of the World Medical Association, but I'm not anymore. I'm just a private citizen. You sure you want me to come? I don't represent anything. Yeah, yeah we want you to come. And so the day began with my giving a seminar to staff, the 150 staff from the organization came to the seminar. And I said, I thought that the AMA represented the economic interests of its members. If anybody had told me a few years ago that I would be invited to the American Medical Association to talk about the social determinants of health and health equity, I would not have believed them. But here I am, and you look pretty enthusiastic to me. And that evening I had dinner with the sort of senior people in the organization. And one of them who'd been at the seminar in the morning said, can you repeat for my colleagues what you said this morning? So I did. Um, and we engaged. I mean, I think the whole issue of the fact that people's suffering ill health through no fault of their own engages people. They may have different views about what's needed uh, to make a difference and what they'll tolerate politically, but reckon, and that's why I don't approach this with some a priori idea of is how much equality, how much inequality, good, bad. I approach it from the point of view of health and health inequality and what we can do to improve health for the poorest, to level up to reduce the unfair inequalities, to make health more equitable, and then engage people in what we need to do to make a difference. Well, you sort of <laughs> tied it all up. I have another 20 questions of my own as well, uh, stemming from uh, why you chose the term social determinants when it appears you talk primarily about economics. And in this country, my preoccupation with race and our preoccupation with race is, of course, an interesting question for future uh, seminars in one way or another. And I apologize to the group as a whole because the questions became overwhelming and uh, the uh, discussion 
welcome Sir Michael became fascinating and uh, distracting, if you will. So since he tied it up as well as he did, I think I will not improve on that. But uh, we thank you so much for uh, being with us today. And this is really, you know, no good epidemic doesn't blow somewhere, something positive. And as you said at the very beginning, um, this electronic interchange has allowed us with this seminar to be less parochial uh, within our own city and allow us to reach out uh, to you. And we, we so much appreciate you joining us today. And uh, we're gonna try to tap you again, but we'll give you a year or two to, <laughs> to, to take care of the rest of the world. So thank you and thank you, Ron, and um, we'll move ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to colleagues that I can't see, all 200 of you. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you.